This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to answer the question, is multisig, is Bitcoin multisig still the best? This was a question from Fernvey219 saying, I've recently seen a video of uh, Andreas Antonopoulos questioning that having a multisig strategy to keep your BTC is not I the ideal solution. At least it is not the ideal solution for everyone. Any thoughts on that? And then uh, someone sent me this link in which Andreas is saying that multisig is not the best option for most people to store their Bitcoin. This is from June of 2023. So this is obviously his latest thoughts on it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this today. We have to start with the context. The overall context you always have to remember when discussing custody and all these other things is that not your keys, not your coins. So the worst thing that you can do is to store your Bitcoin where someone else is holding the keys, like on a Coinbase or BlockFi or Binance or Celsius. For your long-term holdings of Bitcoin, you should buy a Bitcoin-only hardware wallet like the Blockstream Jade or the Cold Card. I'm not being paid by either of them, obviously. And you should withdraw your Bitcoin from the exchange and hold it on that hardware wallet in what's called cold storage. It's called cold storage because your keys never touch the internet and you have a cold wallet rather than a hot wallet. Hardware wallets are the best way to hold your private keys, to use them to sign transactions, and to prevent your private keys, as we said, from ever touching the internet. Because if someone has your private keys or the human readable equivalent, which is your 12 or 24 word recovery seed, this is a series of common English words in a certain order. And if someone has those, if you take a picture of them and upload it online, put it on social media, put it in your email or anything like that, you really risk having your Bitcoin taken. Because if anyone has those 12 words in that order, or those 24 words, they can spend or send your Bitcoin. So that's the basic background on cold storage. Now, there are different types of cold storage. The most common one is what's called single sig or single signature, which means using one hardware wallet, which requires one signature to move or spend the Bitcoin. And then a more complicated version of self-custody and cold storage is called multi-sig, which stands obviously for multi-signatures, in which you're using multiple hardware wallets and in order to spend or send, it requires multiple signatures from these hardware wallets. The most common multi-sig setups, as we've talked about in past videos, is what's called two of three multi-sig, which requires you to sign a Bitcoin transaction with any two out of those three keys, or three out of five multi-sig, which requires you to sign a Bitcoin transaction in order to move that Bitcoin or spend it with any three out of the five keys. These are the two most common setups. In practice, you can design this however you want. If you're running a large corporation, you can have multi-sig that is 10 out of 15 or, or something like that. The Bitcoin protocol here is very flexible. I think one way of thinking about multi-sig for beginners, it's not an exact analogy, but if you've ever gone inside a bank and had a safe deposit box there, a safety deposit box, you'll know that you will have one key most commonly, and the bank will have one key. And in this case, this is sort of like two out of two multi-sig, you might say, where you each need to use your key to open the safe deposit box. Multi-sig, Bitcoin multi-sig is even more flexible because you can have these word combinations like five out of five out of nine multi-sig or something like that. Now, what does a single sig setup require? That was the first option that we talked about. As we said, it requires one hardware wallet which is used to generate your 12 or 24 word recovery seed, which again is a human readable version of your private keys. Now, after you have this seed and you've tested it, so one way of doing this is you create your hardware wallet, you create your seed, you add a small amount of Bitcoin, you record your recovery seed on a piece of paper, then you wipe the hardware wallet, and then you do a recovery on that hardware wallet, you add the 24 or 12 words and see if your Bitcoin is still there. This is called doing a recovery and it's a smart thing to do to make sure that you've, you have the correct recovery seed before you send large amounts of Bitcoin to this wallet. So after you have this seed, this 12 word seed or 24 word seed, and you've tested it, that you can use it to recover your Bitcoin and you found a place to store it offline securely, you probably want to hammer it into one of those metal plates, the various solutions that are out there in case your house catches on fire or there's a flood or something like this, having it just on paper is not a good idea. But once you've stored that your recovery seed securely, whatever that means for your particular situation, you can safely erase your hardware wallet. And this means that in this form of single seed, you only really have one piece of data that's very uh, necessary to store securely, and that's that 12 or 24 word recovery seed. Because if you ever need to sign a Bitcoin transaction in the future, 
And again, if this is in cold storage, you're probably not going to be transacting with it that often. But if you ever need to sign a Bitcoin transaction, you just enter your 12 or 24 word recovery seat, as we talked about, into any hardware wallet, any BIP39 compatible hardware wallet, which is most of them, Cold Card, Blockstream, Jade, uh, what else, Ledger, uh, Trezor, etc. These are all BIP39 compatible hardware wallets. I think it's best to use a Bitcoin only hardware wallet, but any of these can be used to regenerate, reconstitute your wallet just by entering that 12 or 24 word recovery seed. As we said before, never ever type your recovery seed into a computer or website, never take a picture of it, never use it or show it in a public place. You don't want to be doing this in a Starbucks or McDonald's, for example. And when you do do one of these recoveries, it should only, your recovery seed should only be entered on the screen of the hardware wallet. Never enter it into a website. Those will always be fraudulent websites. So in the final analysis, single SIG, as we said, only requires you to store that one item, that 12 or 24 word recovery seed. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to hit that subscribe button to help the spread of the word and to help me out with the algorithm. So as we said, single SIG requires only a single item to back up. Now, by contrast, what does a multi-sig setup require? Let's just go with the simplest version, which would be two out of three multi-sig. You will need three hardware wallets. Each of these will generate its own recovery seed, so then you'll have three sets of recovery seeds. Even if you erase those three hardware wallets after setup, you're still going to have those three sets of 12 or 24 word recovery seeds that will need to be stored safely. And you're going to want to store these, if possible, in different locations, some ideally far away from your house, possibly even in different states or countries, if possible, in different juris jurisdictions, i.e. a geographically distributed multi-sig. This is what we call it. But that's not all, because to reconstitute and to be able to spend your Bitcoin from multi-sig, out of multi-sig, you're also going to need, you're going to need two out of three of those keys to sign. In other words, you're going to need two out of those three recovery seeds, which are representations of your private keys. And then you're also going to need what is called by many different names, most often called a multi-sig wallet configuration file or config file. So that's at least three items. You need two out of three of your recovery seeds, and then you need your multi-sig wallet versus just one item, as we said, for a single sig setup. This is what the configuration file looks like for Unchained Capital, which is a collaborative custody version of multi-sig. And we can see here that we have the three keys. In this case, Unchained keeps one. You have two hardware wallets. And what's in this recovery um, configuration file, you have three XPUBs associated with each of these keys. You have the derivation paths. You have the address type, you have the quorum. In this case, it's two out of three multi-sig. You have the starting address index, et cetera. These, this is all data that needs to be stored. And Unchained makes it very easy. You could just click this download button and store it. But I think this is one of the things that uh, Andreas Antonopoulos doesn't like about multi-sig, that you need, if you, if you lose this information, for example, you're in trouble. If you lose one out of your three recovery seeds, and you lose your multi-sig wallet configuration file, which is this thing, then you're in trouble and your Bitcoin is lost forever. And so I think this is why Andreas thinks that multi-sig should be reserved for these joint custody solutions. For example, if a, you have a corporation, maybe the CEO, the CFO, the general counsel, the board chairman, uh, some external audit firm, et cetera, each have a key. And that's one nice, another nice way of using multi-sig. But I, I would say that I have to disagree with Andreas here. And I think that multi-sig can also be used safely and effectively by serious Bitcoiners who are storing large amounts of their net worth in Bitcoin. Multi-sig is how I store my own Bitcoin. And you just need to keep track of those three recovery seeds and the multi-sig wallet configuration file. I don't think this is a huge burden, especially if you spend as much time thinking about Bitcoin as many of us do. If someone finds that multi-sig wallet configuration file, they can use it to view how much Bitcoin you're holding at that multi-sig address or addresses, but they cannot move or steal that Bitcoin without also having two out of the three keys to sign a transaction. And this makes storing your multi-sig wallet configuration file much more of a privacy risk than a security risk. So you can have multiple copies of it in your house, encrypted on your computer or in different locations, and it's much less of a security risk than storing your recovery seed. Because if someone has this config file, all they really need, all they, they can just see where the treasure is buried is one analogy that's often used. It's a treasure map, but they can't actually take the treasure. In that case, they would need two out of three 
of your recovery seeds or private keys. Bitcoin Multisig is an especially useful solution for public Bitcoiners like myself. So I use Multisig and my keys are geographically distributed. So in order for someone to take and steal my Bitcoin, you would need to take me on a tour to pick up these recovery seeds or hardware wallets in multiple locations. And this difficulty is meant to uh, deter attackers. Multisig can also help to make other Bitcoiners safer as well. For example, if thieves begin to understand, let's say that Bitcoin goes to $500,000 a coin and now becomes extremely profitable to even steal a tenth of a Bitcoin. And so thieves start breaking into people's houses. If thieves begin to understand that a lot of Bitcoiners are using multisig and they can break into your house and maybe get one hardware wallet that has a token amount on it, but doesn't have your real Bitcoin because your keys are spread across the country. If thieves begin to think that most Bitcoiners are like this or big, most Bitcoiners become like this, they're not going to bother breaking into houses anymore just because there won't really be a return on investment. I talk more about this in this video, how multisig makes all Bitcoiners safer. I would agree with Andreas though that multisig is definitely not a first step in your self-custody journey. The progression for Bitcoiners, for new Bitcoiners should be something like this, where at first you buy a tiny amount of Bitcoin because you begin to be curious about it Maybe you leave it on your phone or you leave it on Coinbase, you leave it on the exchange. Again, this is just for complete beginners. And it's important to recognize at this stage that anything that's left on your phone or on the exchange and is not backed up in any way, for example, self-custody wallet on your phone, if someone else is holding your keys, you have to recognize that you can easily lose 100% of this Bitcoin to a hack or a theft. But if this is just 5 or $10 worth of Bitcoin, this is not going to matter for most people. The next step is to learn how to withdraw this Bitcoin to a hardware wallet like the Blockstream Jade or a cold card. As I said, I prefer Bitcoin only hardware wallets. Then you just keep learning about Bitcoin. You go further and further down the rabbit hole. Maybe you start running your own node and you begin to make significantly large, whatever that means for you, large purchases of Bitcoin. That's the point at which I think it makes sense to start to learn how to use multisig. Not as an initial solution for many people, for maybe even for most people, just using a 12 or 24 word single sig recovery seed, maybe with an added password is enough. But multisig really is that next step. And I maintain that it's still the uh, gold standard of Bitcoin cold storage, or maybe I should call it the Bitcoin standard of Bitcoin cold storage. I'm going to give you two easy ways to get started with multisig. The first one is what we alluded to briefly before. It's called collaborative custody, where you have a company that holds one of the three keys or uh, two out of the three keys. For example, if you're using three out of five multisig, that way they can offer you technical support, but they can never steal your Bitcoin because that re would require signing with two keys and they only have one out of the three keys. What is the biggest problem with collaborative custody? It's that it's very difficult to set up without giving these companies your personal information, in other words, KYC. -ing. So you do end up leaking some privacy. They usually know who you are. They can see what IP address you're coming from. They know your name and address probably, and then they can see how much Bitcoin you're holding there. Again, this is not necessarily a security risk. It could become a security risk if their database is hacked and attackers learn uh, your multi-sig address and, or your XPubs, and then they have your home address and they can come and try to pressure you. Though presumably if you're using multi-sig, this would be difficult. But you, what you're mostly leaking if someone finds this or what you're leaking to the parent company, the collaborative custody company, is your privacy. You're not leaking security. The best example of collaborative custody that I know about is Unchained. They used to be called Unchained Capital. You can find them at unchained.com. I'm not being paid or sponsored by them in any way, but they have these multi-sig solutions that they call vaults. And in this setup, basically Unchained will hold one of the private keys, one of the recovery seats, and then you will hold two of them. So you'll have two hardware wallets to keep track of, and they help you set up uh, set this up so it's done the right way on the blockchain. Now, a more advanced level, if you want to have perfect privacy and you don't want to leak anything to a collaborative custody solution like Unchained, is you can learn how to build your own multi-sig vault that relies on your own Bitcoin node. Then what you do is you use multiple vendors, Blockstream Jade, Cold Card, maybe a seed signer or something that you build yourself. And that way you're not reliant on a single hardware wallet manufacturer. This is much more private than using collaborative custody. Here's a pro tip, buy your hardware wallets using a fake name and have them ship somewhere other than your home address. So you don't end up being in one of those databases at the 
hardware wallet company. I believe Cold Card deletes their customer list after 90 days or something like that, but you still want to be safe. Also, Cold Card allows you to pay for your hardware wallet using Bitcoin, which is nice. So you don't have to give them a credit card and leak your home address and your name and your credit card number. So for this more advanced solution, I do cover this. I do cover how to build your own multi-sig vault from scratch and to do it yourself manner in my paid course, which I'll link to in the description notes below. If you scroll down here, you can see that I have what's called the ultimate Bitcoin storage solution, do it yourself multi-vendor that's using different hardware wallet manufacturers, multi-sig. And I have two fairly long lectures on how to set this up as well as lectures on how to set up your own node and connect it to something like this. I would say for many people using Unchained Capital is probably the easiest solution, but if you do want to take this more advanced route, I have a coupon for you. If you use the coupon code HODL, H-O-D-L, that'll get you 10% off your 30-day subscription, and this will give you access to every single lecture on the site, including buying anonymous Bitcoin, coin joining, building your own super secure hardware wallet from scratch, and also how to build these do-it-yourself Bitcoin multi multi-sig vaults, in addition to getting you access to the Bitcoin forum where there have been some interesting discussions happening and are available only to members. I'll put a link in the description notes below. You can just go to this page where it says join. You can choose annual tuition or monthly tuition. You can click get it now and that will take you to the checkout page. And this is where you're going to want to use that coupon. So down here where it says have a coupon code, you can just type in uh, H-O-D-L, click update and that'll take 10% off the price. You'll get access to everything for just over $71 for 30 days. And you can cancel at any time. You can watch all the lectures in the first 30 days and cancel and you won't be charged again, or you can just let your monthly subscription keep going. I hope you found this video. If you did, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.